You're watching In Technology, a video cast where you can get smarter about cybersecurity, sustainability, and technology. Hi, and welcome to today's episode of In Technology. I'm your host, Camille Moorhart, and I have with me as co-host today, Mosin Foslian. Our guest is Doug Fisher from Lenovo. Mosin Foslian is Corporate Vice President and Intel Product Assurance and Security General Manager. He's a 27-year Intel veteran and is responsible for Intel's trust and security and confidential computing roadmaps. He's also responsible for implementation and operationalization of proactive security and risk prioritized measures, security governance and oversight, and continuing to foster the security first culture in Intel's product development. Doug Fisher, our guest, is Senior VP and Chief Security Officer of Lenovo. He's responsible for the integrity of Lenovo's supply chain, products and services, and its data. Before he joined Lenovo, Doug spent over two decades at Intel, where he was most recently Senior VP and GM of the Software and Services Group. Welcome to the podcast, gentlemen. And I'd like to begin by getting to know each of you just a little bit. I know, Mosin, that you ran an assembly and test factory as well as a fabrication facility for Intel in your career. And I think this is arguably one of the things Intel does the best in the world. And so I was just curious if you could take us behind the scenes a little bit and tell us, was there anything that was unexpected to you when you took on these roles? As you mentioned, I've been with Intel for almost 27 years. I joined Intel as a product development engineer, working on our products, mostly CPUs and chipset products. And then in 2006 timeframe, I had the opportunity to go and run one of our assembly and test manufacturing facilities in Costa Rica. I went from a position out from a supplier to becoming a customer. And that truly changed my worldview as far as how a customer uh, and a supplier relationship should work, even though it was an internal supplier customer interactions. And then as I moved from ATM to Fab 12, uh, one of our facilities, Fab facilities in Arizona, again, I went from being a customer to becoming a supplier. And as I came back to uh, product development engineering, And now, obviously, you know, doing the product security for Intel, I think I have benefited from that journey as far as understanding the entire supply chain, again, internal and external. And it has given me a different, again, point of view as far as how I look at the supply chain, especially when it comes to the transparency and security security of the supply chain. I'm going to ask Doug also just a question a little bit. To get to know you a little bit, perhaps, I did find in researching you that you enlisted in the Navy when you were 17. And I was just wondering, that seems very young to me, I was wondering how that maybe shaped part of your career or your approach to solving problems or looking at business over the last decades. (laughs) Say I enlisted, it sounds like I volunteered. I was pretty much a troubled teen. My parents decided the best Solution was to put me in the military at 17 years old, and it turned out great. To be honest, I credit my time in the military to my success today. It just reshaped me as a person. I drove a deep level of commitment, teamwork, and discipline that I still carry forward uh, today. When you're 17 years old, you have that kind of opportunity in your life to really reshape who you are as a person. It really made a difference in my life, and I'm forever indebted to my service to the country as well as my experience in the military. Hey, Doug, I know you and I started interacting a couple of years ago, and I know you are the first to occupy Lenovo's CSO position. Has it been challenging? Can you share some of your journey with us? It was about three and a half years ago. I was asked by the general counsel, CEO, and some of the board members if I'd be willing to take on a new and unique challenge within the company. And at the time, you can look back three and a half years ago, security was certainly important. And I went through a lot of it when I was at Intel, certainly a different environment today than when I took the job. As I jokingly say, some of the things I'm dealing with were not in the brochure when I took the job. But yes, it is extremely challenging and it gets more and more difficult every day. There's new technologies, there's advancements in capabilities, 
the challenge is enormous for all of us in security. On top of that, the new regulations and stipulations put on people in security makes it even more regimented in what you do and how you achieve it at the company. But it's been very rewarding to say, having the visibility and the, the opportunity to educate, drive, and really help get support from everyone on executive staff is a tremendous gift. Uh, it makes my job much more I mean, impactful and having the support of the board and the CEO is instrumental along with all the executives. So it's been a, it's been a great journey. Uh, it continues every day. Both of you are running these security organizations and responsible for helping product divisions ship out product that's secure. And, and yet you're not in the organization of the product division. So I'm wondering when you're organizationally not integrated, how you integrate that philosophy of security first. One thing that I learned early on was security is not just a feature. It, it truly is a mindset. And based on that, we have started uh, an activity at, uh, at Intel to uh, start influencing and changing that mindset. We were very clear that we truly want to get to a point that all of our engineers, as they architect, as they develop our product, as they design or validate our products, that they truly think like a hacker. That I always say, I want them to build, to break what they make, to think about can do with this product that I'm building or architecting, and is forcing it to do something that is not supposed to do, which goes against the traditional way of how we've been architecting and validating our products, which has been, you know, we architected, we build our product, then we validate to make sure it does what it's supposed to do, which is referred to as positive validation. And the, the negative validation or negative testing is looking at it from a hacker point of view. And when you go at it from that angle, it truly changes your worldview again about how you architect, develop, uh, you know, write coding or programs and validate your product. So going to the foundation of how you train and you change the mindset and the culture regarding security has been fundamental for our approach at Intel. And that's one of the ways that we continue to measure our progress forward. Obviously, the journey never ends, but it is fundamental to the success to make sure that you truly are evolving and changing that culture to make security be a forefront of what we do and not just a you know side job that somebody needs to do. If you look back years ago, it used to be the whole mantra is around quality. How do you design in quality? How do you design in manufacturing? Bill, now it's how do you design in security? But it really goes back to where most of us speaking about. It's a culture. It's not just one thing. I took this job, the first thing I did is demystify what security really was. It often goes to either a product issue or something, something to do with infrastructure, but it's actually a collection of a lot of capabilities all working in unison. And when I started this job, we really had an opportunity to turn up the contrast at how we take this as a cultural element at Lenovo. And what I've done in that space is require everyone in the company and I say everyone, I mean everyone in the company, has to take training, has to have the, their system with the latest uh, patches and updates. Otherwise, they don't get on the network. And what I mean, everyone on executive staff has to take this training, including our CEO. I have sent emails to, to people at the highest levels in the company. I will be, re re uh, will be removing you from the network tomorrow uh, if you don't take your training. And it, it's actually, shockingly, I get apology messages versus uh, some sort of pushback. And we do this across all elements. It's actually quite draconian, but you have to, you cannot take anything for granted. If you have a, a system on the network, we don't know who the manager is of the system. The patches aren't updated. We used to work to try to find who the owner was, try to make sure that they get the right elements in place. I took a different approach. I said, cut them off the network. I made sure that it, the CEO and execs all knew that I was going to take systems down and there may be some business impact, but it's far less impact than if we had some situation that the vulnerability was exposed. So I've shut those off, just like you shut the air supply off on a scuba diver, they surface. And when you look at the Pantheon, the top part of the Pantheon, which is supported by our foundation, which is our culture, 
and the four pillars, which is product security, supply chain security, physical, physical security, and infrastructure security. All those four elements are all in place to do one thing, the most important, which is protecting our customers' data and privacy and our employees' data as well. So we take that very seriously. And I have to tell you, it's somewhere over 75%. I've talked to a lot of customers and partners, named companies in the industry outside of our industry. Well over 70, closer to 80% of vulnerabilities occur at the employee level. They are our biggest asset in the company. However, they need to be trained. One of the challenges that we always face with training is how to make training fun. And one of the items that we uh, found very effective is what we call red teaming or hackathon events. And initially, this starts with a you know, handful of uh, security experts, but eventually, you know, uh, we try to get non-security expert people engaged and hands-on in this activity. And I never forget this, as we were trying to instill this security first mindset into the organization, I approached one of our design managers and I asked him if he was willing to partner with us to attack one of the modules. And he said, sure. We have spent about two weeks basically going deep doing the hackathon and red teaming event on that module. And we found 10 serious security vulnerabilities on that module, which if he would have let the product out, he had to re-spin the silicon. And for him, that was the, like the turning moment that he needed to invest, he needed to take this very seriously. And from there on, we have been using the red teaming or hackathon events as some of the fun activities to truly, you know, let engineers find the security vulnerabilities by themselves. And the moment they do that, then they start seeing the value in investing time and learning more uh, about this type of security events. Now, red teaming is a great example where we use it as well. The key to anybody at security is the things you don't want to have happen. You don't want them to get the data and you don't want it to move laterally. And so red teaming really helps you exercise that muscle. Are you protecting the data and are you protecting any vulnerability from going lateral? If, if they get into your environment, can you stop the lateral movement? Doug, you mentioned the human element as one of the major kind of points of vulnerability, like phishing attacks. But I'm just wondering, what are your customers noticeably concerned about right now in security? And I also just want to lead the witness a little and ask, are people starting to worry about AI and how that's going to become or, or help advance threats? So they're worried about the same thing. Primarily, like you said, the employee. Now, it's always been a challenge, but you all know, you, you get these phishing emails and they were so rudimentary for years. Broken sentences, unstructured, the wrong choice of vocabulary, all the things associated with a very poorly written a phishing email. Today, with the element of AI helping curate who you are as a person, because a lot of executives have exposure on the internet, so they can pull all that information and curate who you are and write a much more specific email to who you are as a person. They can also write much faster. It's I just had a situation. I was um, out of the country. I would dealt with PayPal. I hadn't dealt with PayPal for years. I had to use PayPal for something. And two days later, I got an email. Hey, we have the invoice for PayPal. And so it registered with me. Oh, it must be what I was trying to achieve. And so I engaged in this. And it didn't look familiar. And so instead of clicking accept, I did take the time to call PayPal and walk through it with them. The fascinating thing was it was very specific to me. And the email, you, I couldn't believe it, neither could PayPal, but we researched it as true. The email address it came from was a legitimate PayPal email. Their address was, it wasn't a PalPay or some other variation. It was their email. And I had them send me an email from that account and we compared them. No difference in email. Somebody's going to be able to intercept and spoof email addresses now. Really sophisticated capabilities. AI has gone even further. Now it's voice imitation. So I do a lot of keynotes. They can capture my voice. And so voice verification is going to be a new challenge because they can certainly use my voice and rephrase anything I say. 
And then video. Give you a great example. I don't know if you read about it in Hong Kong. There was a situation where a company somehow, I, I don't remember the specifics, but they got a video conference with who they thought was the CFO, if I got the story right. So the, the employees, uh, the, the group was on this video conference with the CFO. And the CFO walked through, I think, a deal or some, some mechanism, talked to everybody. In the end, they cut a 20 million pound or $25 million in that range. Uh, transfer of funds. They lost it. All through him simulating a person that they thought they worked for. Now, the, the specifics may be a bit different, but the fact is it's happening. People are spoofing all this stuff. And so it's very scary. Spoiler alert, I'm using this, this approach for a kickoff and a lot of my speeches now to show people I'm going to do, it's going to make it a lot easier on me. They'll write the script. They'll, they'll do a video of me. I'm doing that this week. We're we'll right. The whole script that I set back and I don't do a thing. AI does my entire talk. And then I'll step in at the end and say, oh, by the way, that wasn't me. That's crazy. Mosin, save us here and tell us, is there any like sort of positive use case or emerging use cases for AI that are driving new models here for security? It always reminds me of the old radar detector scheme that Police will come with a better scheme to catch on the speed. Then the radar detectors will come with something to mask that one. And it was always a race. And I'm glad, I think the radar detectors have gone. And I'm glad that that was the end to that game. But with security vulnerabilities and AI, it is a race. In the past, some researchers used to spend a lot of time to, I would call it daisy chain, known vulnerabilities to come up with new ones. So they literally will go and read all the known vulnerabilities that you have published, some of your specs that you have published, or even errors that you have published. And then connecting all of those, they will find a new way to break your product. And today, it would take them months and months to do it. And today, usage of AI is uh, they can daisy chain those known vulnerabilities in a matter of minutes and come up with the new attack vectors. But obviously, you know, the, the security teams are not sitting on their hand either. So we are coming up with uh, new ways of uh, finding those issues and patching them before, obviously, you know, the, the bad actors do that. First priority is security for AI, making sure that the AI products that we are developing and we are designing and shipping is secure, meaning we have enhanced security capabilities inside our company, whether it's security development lifecycle, content, scanning capabilities, again, red teaming, hackathons, uh, again, using AI uh, to enhance your security capabilities uh, inside the company. So that's one item. The other one is, as Doug mentioned, customers do care about the security and privacy of their, of their data. And I think when you reflect back on the past couple of years, the security of the data in transfer has come a long way. As you are sending emails or as you're having a transaction with your bank, I think that data transfer is much, much more secure than what it used to be, you know, a few years ago. Now, the, the new focus is on the confidentiality and security of the data in use. So, when the data arrives in your, you know, call it the, uh, the processor unit, whether it's a GPU or CPU or so on and so forth, what's happening inside that processing unit up to now it's been open. Meaning if somebody found a way to hack into your processing unit, there your data was exposed. And the confidential computing is where we are starting to, you know, treat that data the same way as the data in transit. So it's encrypted, it's protected, it's confidentially, again, protected. So this way, the customers, the enterprise can self-assure that even the data transaction within the CPU or in, within the CPU and memory, at Intel, we have started with SGX and then TDX to protect that data. And then the next logical step is confidential AI, which is how you use this capability to enable, you know, different companies to be able to collaborate without really having to worry about sharing their confidential data. 
as I said, it is a race. The AI for the good guys and the AI for the bad guys are enhancing and developing. But obviously, I'm glad that we are on the good guy side and we will continue to work to make sure that the data for our customers and for our end users is absolutely secure. The bad guys have a lot of money. It's profitable. Oftentimes, people think it's somebody with a, a low-end system that's clever. No, these people have high-end systems. They have the best in technology, but so do we. And one of the advantages we have is our data. Now, I'm responsible in my organization for our data retention policy as well. What data you collect, how long do you keep it, when does it get disposed of? That hygiene is so critical for our customers to ensure that they don't give us data we don't need. We don't keep data we don't need, and we get rid of data we don't need so that we don't have data exposure for our customers. And then we obviously spend our time focusing on protecting it. But we could also use data about our employees and what's their behavior, what how what applications they use, what type of procedures they usually go through, what's their normal day, and use that data, the information, to look for anomalies. That's fascinating. Doug just logged in in Seattle, Washington for the last three months, and now he's in Cairo. Maybe we should ask him a much more, a bunch of new security questions that we normally don't ask because this isn't normal behavior. He never has a- accessed this application before. Maybe we should ask a few more questions or a few more security hurdles before we allow access. Take an advantage of AI to look at our data and then understand the behaviors. Things like that can be applied with artificial intelligence, along with some of the regulations that are occurring unilaterally in in government agencies across the globe. So it isn't all lost, but we're going to keep busy. One thing that you had mentioned before, I think, Doug, is that you're responsible for protection of the supply chain. And I just wanted to go back to that and understand a little bit more from you about how you even begin to look at protecting the supply chain. That's a great question. You know, we have tens of thousands of vendors and components that we put into our systems. What we do is isolate it to the active components, things that can, could have a potential vulnerability that we don't do as much on a capacitor and a resistor or a piece of sheet metal. But if it's memory or CPU or whatever, an active element in our platform, then we actually have a very rigorous process that we work with the vendor to understand their security posture Do they align with our security uh, requirements? We have a contractual relationship with these suppliers, and then we have the right to audit these suppliers. It's called the trusted supply chain. So we have a very rigorous process that we employ. LNO would ensure that we know who the vendors are, know what their security posture is, know if they meet it, and help them remediate any issues. Then we have an active list, and it happens at times when we have a supplier. This happens across the industry where there's a component that no longer is one we should be using. We instantly pull that out, replace it, and ensure that uh, we minimize, just like other other companies in the industry. So that's our trusted supply chain. Now we go a step further than I think anybody else in, in the industry in our field, and that's partnering with uh, Intel on what's called transparent supply chain. And that is a, a real advantage for what we do in supply chain, where we work with Intel to basically create a fingerprint at a station of what was built in the factory. So whatever you build, and by the way, this is why physical security is so important as an overlay, because you you have to know who's in the factory, who has access to it. Once it leaves the factory, who's the shipping company, who's, you know, who's touching this thing all the way along the path. We have that as an overlay on top of our products, along with this transparent supply chain, which is going to what we call zero trust supply chain with Intel. And what we do is take a fingerprint at a station of what is in this platform, it's encrypted. It goes through the entire supply chain process and lands on a customer's environment. Now they have a a portal, web portal, and they bring it up and it compares hashtag information, decrypts it, it compares. Is what we built in the factory exactly what you have brought into your environment? And if there's any difference, obviously it's alert set and that system will not come online. We protect it in that way as well. I tell you, when I go out to customers, which I do a lot, that's one of the key topics. They really phrase it in business continuity, but it really is your supply chain resiliency and security. When it comes to the supply chain, I truly look at it, and I want Intel to look at it from sand to sand. 
So from the time that you turn the sand into silicon and goes into building a platform, and then that platform gets transported, as you mentioned, to your OEM and ODMs, and then uh, gets deployed. And during that deployment, you know, gets updated with security updates to keep it always up to date to a point that it retires and it, get, it gets grinded and turns back into sand. I think that's the entire supply chain that we are looking at. And the TSC 2.0 is coming about, which will have more capabilities to enhance the transparency and security of the supply chain. One other thing that I wanted to offer here, Camille, was um, getting the platform to end users, as Doug mentioned, to make sure they receive what they're supposed to receive is very important. Uh, and at the same time, keeping it up to date to make sure it's always secure is as important. And I know there was an article a while back about Intel's secret lab and what is this secret lab. And basically what it is, it's we, we come to realize that in order for us to be able to provide security updates to our platform as old as, you know, platform that been launched almost seven to 10 years ago, we needed to be able to have those platforms available because when we are doing a security patch, again, we go back to those old platforms, validate the patch to make sure that it works. And so that created this long-term retention, I would call it a mega lab that we have at Intel, which we house about 4,000 platforms today. And it's probably going to grow to about 6,000. When you say platforms, you're talking about a PC or a server literally sitting in a physical location somewhere. Should something go wrong in the future, even though Intel's no longer, and Lenovo maybe is no longer selling the system anymore, it's like, should there be a problem, you have an ability to quickly go and tackle what it is? For some reasons, we do hold on to platforms even up to 10 years because customers are asking for it and they're willing to pay for it that extend the servicing. So to answer your question, yes, these are platforms in a form of a PC or a bare metal server with all the peripherals and software stack that is needed to run that uh, platform in a, in a production environment. You asked me earlier about my learnings in the military. Let me tell you, the best training I got as a leader was at Intel. I mean, it's phenomenal. And I went to a lot of the hard burn and scars that most is talking about when I was there. And I think I've been able to bring that into Lenovo. What has been applied at Lenovo? It's a broad set of things. I think I mentioned earlier, we have a centralized security re review board out of Morrisville. And so all elements go through that. So it's a central pipeline that brings the experts in a consistent way to review our products. The other thing that's really fascinating is because of how we built up Lenovo because of the assets we acquired from IBM and from the Motorola assets from Google. We have a steep heritage, an IBM heritage primarily, and my organization has all the security experts that came over when we acquired the Motorola capabilities are still working for us. And they put a level of rigor around some of the key components that we provide to our customers. One of those, because of the acquisition, we build out what's called our ICE lab, for example. And the ICE lab is a secure lab for our critical firmware that we build for our data center products. And the ICE lab is biometrically controlled. So you have to have access and it has to be uh, authorized. Once you get into that lab, you had to have been a US passport holder. So you have a, we have a steep level of rigor to even get access. And then you have to have the same credentials to sign the firmware. And so that level of rigor really assures our customers that we know who's working on our firmware. We know who's touching it. We know who's signing it. And we use that information to help reassure customers what is happening. And I can tell you that other companies in our business will not have that information, will not have that level of control over what is being done in their firmware. And that's a competitive advantage for Lenovo. Thank you very much, 
Doug Fisher, Senior VP at Lenovo and Chief Security Officer. And thank you for co-hosting with me today, Mosin, Corporate Vice President of Intel's Product Assurance and Security Group. Thanks, it was great to be here. Hey, thank you so much, Doug. Never miss an episode of In Technology by following us here on YouTube or wherever you get your audio podcasts. The views and opinions expressed are those of the guests and author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Intel Corporation. Thank you.